Okay, well, uh, the introduction comes from uh, Frank, so kick off. What are we going to talk about today? Uh, during our presentation, we'll talk about uh, the importance of IP uh, in investment and uh, yeah, continuity of your of of uh, your company, either startup, scale up company, but also more mature companies. Um, we do that uh, by first looking at the investment side. So how do investors look at intellectual property? How do they look at structuring of companies? Um, and how do they evaluate uh, a, a company when they're looking to invest in a company? That's the part uh, Jono will do. Um, and then uh, I will go a bit into uh, um, the more legal side. Maybe it's good to introduce our background. Jono is uh, investment manager uh, yep. in ACFG. Um, I think you'll introduce ACFG yep. in your first slides. And uh, I'm an attorney at law and uh, at Lauer's Advocate, which is a, a, a law firm that is specialized in IP, IT, uh, e-commerce and privacy. Um, I will uh, talk you through the ins and outs of, of structuring of, of a company and uh, go through a step plan that we do a lot with uh, yeah, our customers to, to uh, structure their company uh, in a way that their IP um, is uh, safe and, 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 and in, uh, uh, structured in a way that it's future proof. Uh, after that, to give you an insight on how these two worlds uh, combine, uh, we'll go into the details of a case from QLayers, who's a QLayers is a client uh, of of uh, our law firm, but is also a client of the investment firm yeah. uh, where Yono works. So uh, they went through the uh, exposition of uh, the IP allocation um, structure or, or the, the, the structuring of the IP and after that or during that uh, restructuring got an investment uh, through uh, ACFG. Yeah, yeah, through our fund. Yeah, who uh, who are we? Well, I am uh, Jonne van der Donk and as uh, Frank just introduced me, I work as an investment manager at, uh, at ACFG. And uh, there we invest in, uh, in promising companies um, and there we take a minority stake and we try to make that company bigger and uh, try to uh, sell it after a period of five to, uh, to seven years for hopefully a lot more uh, money and then our investors are happy uh, as well. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I already introduced myself. I'm an attorney at law. Um, yeah, and I mainly work in the IP uh, practice, so that's uh, good. We're, what we're, what I'm going to talk about today. Well, but first, uh, the QLayers case, and perhaps it's uh, just really easy because uh, uh, image uh, gives us more information than a thousand words. So this is what the QLayers does, and they uh, they code tanks automatically. Well, here on the left side, you see how it's done manually, and that's the, the previous way of doing it. And uh, on the right side, you see the technology of Q layers. So they made a tank queue, that's uh, that's how it's called, and, uh, and they spray or coat the tanks. But what they also do is they coat wind blades, and here you see that as well. So it's uh, on a really high level of in intensity and precision they can coat the uh, blades of uh, wind turbines as well and they're really long they're like over 80 uh, meters so they need a lot of coating and that's also done manually right now so uh, the robot should make it a lot more easier but once upon a time the story of q layers well first let me make a little bit more room because it's a long story here is the timeline well, on the upper left side, you have uh, Josephine, which is the CEO of QLayers. And on the upper le uh, down left side, it's uh, Ruben, the CTO of QLayers. And uh, Ruben had, a, had an ID, so uh, he, uh, he wanted to commercialize it, but he wasn't that real uh, entrepreneur. And there was where he found 
Josephine, and then they came together and they had the idea of starting Q layers. Well, Ruben uh, already thought of the name. He bought some do domain names and then they founded the company and then they made some robots. But then, yeah, the money, they were out of money and then they needed an investor, an, an, an investment and an investor. That's where I came along to, together with ACFK. Um, yeah, they also fast some uh, some patents, so a lot of I IP was already happening before we stepped in. But what do we do then? Because uh, we are ACFK, Eindhoven Corporate Finance Group, and we are located in uh, in Eindhoven, and we have around ten to fifteen people uh, working here. Some more flexible than others, but uh, but we have quite a large team, and we have three fields of uh, of expertise. First, it's our uh, consultancy slash advising branch, and that's finance and growth. We ha also have the venture capital branch, and this is where we do our in investments. So we invested in Q layers, and that's what we do with our funds. We have uh, two funds now from about 20 to 30 million, and uh, with that money, we try to invest in, uh, in on about 10 to 15 companies. And we also have investment services, and with this branch, we help other investors to make good in uh, investments. And uh, normally I am working in the French capital uh, branch. Yeah. Well, but what is investing? Because uh, it's quite a large area of, uh, of expertise and uh, you have five types of, of investing. And first one is friends, families and fools. And that's uh, just your uncle or your mother who believes in your story and then she wants to give you a little bit of money to uh, just get that ID going. Well, the second uh, uh, type is seed capital informal business in uh, investors or business angels. And this is what you normally see at the Dragon's Den episodes um, and that they're normally um, entrepreneurs who already exited uh, once or twice with a lot of money and now they want to uh, to give the chance to uh, other companies as well. Well, the third one, that's fan, venture capital. That's what we do. Then we normally invest in a little bit more larger companies and there we take a minority stake. Private equity, that's for the larger firms. We normally own around um, 10 million revenue. Per, per company, so that's uh, larger uh, companies. And the IPO is in Dutch, the Beursgang. So that's uh, for the shells. And, uh, and last time it was uh, the, the basic fit. Uh, they, uh, they already, they also had an IPO. But what's different in these five types of, uh, of investing? And it's normally based on the ticket size. So your, your mother gives you 10, thousand euros hopefully if she's pretty rich but we uh, but we only start with VC at 500k and and IPOs only start with millions of, uh, of euros so the ticket size is a little bit more it's larger when the uh, when, when the skills going up also the formalized steps well your uh, your aunt just just gives you the money and believes in your story whereas a private equity uh, company gives you a contract of a thousand pages that you have to uh, agree on this and apply to this and otherwise they are not willing to invest in your company. And the last one is entrepreneurial to managerial and we are as a VC on the flip side on, uh, of, of this scale because we, we already believe in the entrepreneur but you also have to have a really good managerial company and um, when you go further up the, the scale, the entrepreneurial side is less important and you need to have a really good organization as well. So these are the four types of uh, investing. But that wasn't exactly what we were talking about because we are uh, talking about intellectual property. And that's also really important for investors because when we do our due diligence, and this is the what ought we do when we do an investment? We check for the company's insights, and that's via the due diligence. 
and uh, we check on 19 uh, elements and two of them are really focused on intellectual property. So it is really important to us. And normally when we do that due diligence, we get to, to the company and then we say, well, uh, do you have any intellectual property? And, uh, and they all say, well, no, we don't have any patents. But then I say, well, but don't you have copyright, like a user manual or a website? And then they say, oh, yeah, 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 we, we do have that. And don't you have trademarks like a brand or, or something? Well, yeah, we do have that. And, and so on. So also the, the company name, which is used on the internet, here on, on the website of Yes Delft, it's already mentioned eight times. Models and drawings. Well, yeah, they invented their, uh, their, their robots, so they made drawings. Patents and trade secrets slash know-how. So company secrets that you want to keep safe as well. And when you show them this, then they say, yeah, oh, well, we do have intellectual property. And what do we then check for? Is there any IP? Who owns the IP? Are there any intra-group licenses? That's something that uh, uh, Frank is going to tell you more about. Are there any outside group licenses, collaboration agreements or uh, collaborations on research and development? Employee contracts, how is IP handled? Shared IP, any zekerheidsrechten or security rights on, on the IP, and change of control that has any effect on IP. And when we know this, then we are sure that we can invest in the, uh, in the company because intellectual property means value. And how does that work? Because we normally want to see the, the IP like in a treasure chest that we want to keep safe because the, the next buyer, when we make the company a little bit more uh, big, then the next buyer, he can really use that IP for its own value and use its dis distribution networks or just his knowledge of the market just to make that, elect that intellectual property more valuable. And that's what we do. And that's why we want to keep it really, really safe. And that's why the intellectual property needs to be secured in a safe way. And now Frank is going to tell you how you're going to do that, how to make that IP really secure. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to break down the structuring and how we look at IP in uh, in restructuring a bit. Um, but yeah, I think it's always good to start with uh, uh, why is this important? And um, I uh, what we see a lot in, in the companies that, uh, that come to us is that it's not one, not always clear where IP rights are. Um, that may mean that IP rights um are, are vested in the wrong company are vested with old employees are vested with maybe uh, old shareholders um or uh that ip rights are uh, in the operating company so uh, a lot of notaries they uh, will advise companies to to uh, start with the layered structure having a a holding company and a, a operating company uh, but they tend to forget to mention that um, if you, for, for IP purposes, want to use this structure in the right way, um, there should be some agreements between uh, these two companies and uh, there, sh there uh, should be a way uh, of maintaining a split between the holding company and the operating company. Um, yeah. Now, then uh, I think what Jono also already mentioned is that uh, our clients are not always aware uh, what IP rights they own. And I think it also helps uh, if we sit down with these clients and we go over what do you do and, and, and um, uh, what have you created in, in, uh, until now to get a good overview of what IP rights there are. 
So if they go to the to the investor that they can show a clear overview of what IP rights there are, uh, where they're located and how uh, uh, they are maintained. Um, yeah, this is a, just a, a short overview uh, of, of what IP rights there are. Of course, there there's a trademark here. Uh, there are copyrights on, for instance, the software this robot is running on. Maybe copyright on the form. Uh, so might also be design rights uh, on on how how it looks. Then technology that may be patented, which will uh, probably in the photonics industry be uh, there are a lot of patents. Um, then uh, trade secrets. Um, if you cannot, if others cannot look into into the robot, there might also be parts of the robot that uh, you don't don't want to have out there. Uh, at all, which uh, yeah is in in a lot of industries also very important. Uh, I know in the photonics industry that a lot of uh, foundries um, have uh, ways of operating that that uh, are seen rather as trade secrets than that they fall under any other IP right. So uh, it's always good to be aware of uh, what part of of uh, your your know-how is protected under uh, intellectual property right, but also what's under trade secrets. And if things are trade secrets, you also have to take steps to protect them. Um, as we have in, in the Netherlands, the Wetbescherming with Reisgeheimen, so uh, trade secrets were already protected under uh, the TRIPS agreement, uh, in international regulation. Um, but are now also in our local uh, in, in the Dutch regulation protected. So, yeah, then there is a division between the two. Uh, you have registered rights, uh, patent right, design right, trademarks, uh, which um, of which is normally easy uh, to find out who the uh, owner is, uh, because the one who registered uh, it. Uh, would normally be the be the owner, um, and you have and you have non uh, registered IP rights, um, which in the um, uh, first step of this uh, IP uh, restructure is always a challenge to find out, um, especially the non registered IP rights where where they are vested, because that will normally follow from uh, agreements. Um, uh, yeah, with with parties that that made these IP rights. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, then, um, why uh, why structure? I went over these two questions already in the previous slides a bit. Um, there is a, a real risk in not knowing where your IP rights are. Um, I, I think there are a few more IP lawyers in this call um, who, who uh, can confirm that. It, yeah, it sometimes happens that uh, uh, entrepreneurs think they are uh, owning certain IP rights, but they don't. But they don't. And if uh, the if companies uh, want to start getting money or uh, they go into uh, uh, restructuring uh, and there is certain value already then um, the the further you are along and the more value is in your company the harder it get, uh, tends to get to uh, uh, retrieve intellectual property rights or uh, to transfer these uh, intellectual property rights in the right entity um, then um, what is the risk of having these IP rights in an operating company? I think I'll go to next slide and, and in, illustrate a little bit um, uh, the the flip side. If if they are not in your your operating company and uh, you get into uh, uh, rough weather uh, on financial due to financial circumstances, and your IP is in your uh, operating company, there is. Um, yeah, it's very hard to uh, uh, to restart your company. Uh, you'll have to uh, uh, 
get your or buy your IP rights from uh, um, out of the bankruptcy, which will cost you money, which will uh, take uh, probably take time. Um, and uh, the new company you start uh, has a, a lower chance of succeeding than when an operating company would go bankrupt and IP rights would be uh, safe in a, in a holding company, which could restart uh, normally much faster. Uh, an example of this is uh, the Sense uh, umbrella, which you may know. Uh, it's on the left of, of the slide. It's the Storm Paraplu uh, in Dutch. Um, this company uh, went bankrupt, I think when, around 2018. Um, so in the newspaper, it said uh, Sense files for bankruptcy. But very soon after this news, uh, a new headline in the papers that uh, uh, Sense uh, was gonna uh, continue um, at, at, as a company. Um, and what was the reason? Um, yeah, the the uh, holding company of Sense did not go, not go bankrupt. Just the licensee, which was the operate, uh, operating company, went bankrupt. And basically, uh, all the li licenses uh, elapsed uh, and uh, uh, or ended. Um, and uh, they founded a new operating company, which uh, took the new licenses and, and went on with, this, with the same company. Actually, when uh, we gave this example in a, a previous uh, um, uh, presentation we did, somebody said, yeah, but they went bankrupt again. <laughs> so it didn't uh, work out after all. Uh, if you now Google them, uh, you see that in June of this year, they restarted again. So it's their third try and they said again the uh, operating company went bankrupt but the uh, license uh, the uh, ip was still in the holding company so um yeah you can give it a, a few tries i want i wonder how they finance these new operating companies now but um yeah then where to start if you haven't thought of this structure uh it might uh, seem a big operation to go, for instance, from one uh, uh, entity to to multiple entities and uh, create this this uh, uh, IP structure. Um, yeah, we normally uh, within uh, Lowers we go through three phases. One is always locate, as I said, and I'll give an example after this slide. Um, you find IP at in strange places, uh, and it's. I, I think it's always good to start with uh, having a good overview what IP there is, where it's located, um, before you start structuring. Um, normally, if, if in the more complex company uh, companies, this this involves uh, a notary to see what structure or what what way of restructuring is the most beneficial for the company. Um, it, most of the time in the restructuring, there are some uh, tax uh, components to it because um, IP rights need to be transferred between entities and to really separate these entities, there needs to be uh, uh, commercially, um, a commer commercially, uh, yeah, normal commercial agreements between these entities so uh, they can be seen as two separate entities. Okay, uh, they're my English. Uh, At arm's length, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, then uh, if uh, this transfer needs to happen, the IP sometimes need to, needs to be valued. So the transfer needs to be at, at commercially reasonable terms. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, and then uh, transfers, uh, transfer, transfers of assets need to happen. Um, if it's from the operating BV to the holding company, that's only one transfer. But as you'll see in the next slide, uh, these can be quite a few transfers. Uh, 
And then the last step, when every uh, all the I, all the assets are uh, located at the right place, uh, there need to, uh, needs to be licenses between uh, the holding company and the operating BV or BVs. Um, Okay, now how does it go in practice? Um, we normally start with, because the questions are mainly the same uh, in the most uh, technolo uh, technology companies, we find the same uh, assets. So we go over questionnaire with, with a bunch of questions like where, where are uh, your employees? Do they have contracts? Uh, very simple things that for many entrepreneurs say, okay, uh, why do you ask this question? Again, uh, we find strange things, uh, but also uh, we saw the the, the websites. Uh, what have you registered? Are there patents? Are there patents pending? Um, before the company uh, was founded, uh, who were involved already? Are there contracts with these uh, 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 these people? Um, this gives us an overview uh, based on, on, on this and, and our uh, first meeting with uh, the entrepreneur. And we make an overview. Uh, this is uh, an anonymized uh, overview that I made for a client uh, for which we did a, a restructuring. Um, yeah, there. Uh, this was the starting point and there are a lot of things uh, going on uh, right here. I'm taking my uh, notes for this one. Um, yeah, uh, to start, uh, there was there were uh, two founders, uh, which uh, one was uh, an ex ex shareholder. They uh, bought his shares, but it turns out that it turned out that they paid the, mo the money. But there were no IP clauses in this uh, in this exit. Uh, so we have IP. We had quite some important IP in at an ex shareholder. Uh, we found one of the core employees, which had no agreement at all. Uh, um, they thought he was in an, uh, on an assignment agreement, but uh, they couldn't uh, give us any agreement. Uh, yeah, so in the end, he concluded there there was no <laughs> no agreement actually signed with this employee. Um, these two employees um, are employed by the holding company. Uh, employees are also risk um, in financially. Uh, if uh, you get in financially uh, rough weather, one of the things you one is that you can get rid of uh, of part of your employees um, uh, if you need to. Uh, so that was another another liability. Then this IT company that uh, made a part of the essential software uh, signed an NDA with an uh, IP transfer to the holding company, but also had a deed of transfer. Uh, I don't know. Do you see uh, question marks? Question marks appearing. I no, you don't see it. Uh, then perhaps you have to go to the last slide of this one. Then that maybe I can do it like this. No, it's at a standstill completely. Or perhaps okay. you can just locate the question marks then. Yes. Oh, uh, now there are question marks yeah, everywhere. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they popped up one, but uh, but does it work now? So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Works no, slowly. No, okay. I'll just leave all the que all the question marks here. Um, so I'm. If you you don't also don't see my yeah you see my mouse no you see no. okay I'll I'll guide you through it. The IT company right uh, bottom it signed an NDA with an IP transfer both with the uh, or with the holding company top holding and a digital transfer of IP rights with the um, operating company. Then uh, there is ABC Design Holding BV, which had absolutely no uh, use at all. It was just uh, an, an extra holding that didn't do, didn't do anything. Um, then there was an ABC uh, Technology 
Beve, which was also uh, doing nothing. It had a small, uh, it, had, it had some agreements, uh, in all the agreements in it, uh, but didn't do anything. Then we looked at where the patents were filed and they turned out to be yeah, uh, at A, uh, uh, B, C, B, V, which is left. It actually was the name of the, the top holding but it had uh, the yeah uh, streepjes dashes dashes between them um, and yeah it, it was uh, we asked okay is is this uh, on this company also asked the uh, patent attorney and they uh, weren't aware that this was not the, an actual company this company was terminated uh, two or three years uh, earlier. Uh, and the patent was still filed on uh, on the name of that company. So that's and, and this is not even all that we found. I, I took quite a, a few things out. So yeah, then then our work uh, uh, basically st starts, um, and we start repairing this. Uh, how do you repair this? Now this ex shareholder signed a deed of transfer. The em employee signed a. Uh, uh, an uh, assignment agreement, but also signed a, uh, with a with a deed of transfer in it, uh, assigning the IP to the holding. Um, yeah, so these are not things that are uh, not we're not able to repair. Uh, the final thing that that I forgot is that the blue arrows there needed to be an in, uh, intercompany license, where ABC Design was actually licensing software to. Uh, companies, uh, the agreement one you see, um, but didn't have any rights regarding this software. All uh, all these rights were in in the top holding. So yeah, we uh, and luckily the patent attorney could resolve the mistake that was made with a, 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 a fairly simple. Uh, letter uh, and in the end the, the name was changed because it was a, a clear mistake that was made and uh, that was resolved. So most most things can still be resolved. Uh, okay, um, when when all these uh, all the IP was in the ABC holding or is in the ABC holding and there uh, everything structured in the right way. Then uh, we we uh, start with uh, the restructuring. There are a few ways of of uh, restructuring. Most common way is a, a transfer of assets. What I, what I explained, we start transferring. Uh, I slide. I do that Okay. The most uh, common way is transfer of assets. Uh, in the transfer of assets, we uh, 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 sell uh, the the rights uh, from by one company to the other. Um, if they if they have no value, uh, uh, maybe small parts of IP that uh, were still in uh, with with an, an ex employee uh, that was already paid uh, or an, an ex uh, assignee. Uh, that was already paid, then that can be for nothing. But if it's uh, from the operating company to the holding, most of the time there's value uh, in that. So you have a sale of, of of assets to the right company and you have to pay a, a sales price. Um, that's why you need a valuator and a tax specialist. Other options, which are uh, no less common, but it's also done sometimes as a demerger. If you go from a simple structure, if you only have one entity now, you would want to go to, uh, for instance, uh, uh, two entities a holding with a operating company. Uh, it's you can sometimes uh, demerger splitting uh, in Dutch uh, uh, have a, a entity drop down from uh, from the top top company. Which will then then become uh, the holding, and uh, the the dropped down uh, company will become uh, the operating company. Uh, good thing about this is that uh, yeah, it's called transfer by uh, universal succession. Um, that 
there is no sales. Uh, so that means there's no taxation needed and um, uh, there's no valuation needed. Um, other options not used uh, very much, uh, pledging, uh, user fruct, which is fruchtgebruik, um, or transfer of uh, IP rights as, as dividend, for instance, to uh, 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 top holding uh, or to uh, shareholders. Um, you'll see in the next slide that uh, in at least in our common way to do this uh, with the transfer of assets, we after the uh, IP is distributed in the right way, uh, we use this uh, payment uh, in, in, in form of IP as, as dividend as a way of uh, maintaining all the IP in the holding company. We do that by uh, uh, with an intercompany licensing. In the, uh, the, the perfect structure, we have a holding with all the IP rights and we have an operating company with all the contracts with clients. And you can also put your employee or your yeah your non non essential employees uh, there. Um, you sign an intercompany license. And what does this intercompany license do? It's it licenses IP rights to an operating company, uh, giving it the right. Uh, giving it the right to uh, use the intellectual property rights. I see that the slides are not uh, working again, so. Interesting, um, but OK, uh, on, on my slide, there are uh, arrows now which are not on your slide. Um, there's an arrow down from holding company to the operating company with a license of IP rights, giving the right to use these IP rights or to sub-license these IP rights to, to clients. Um, you, these contracts with clients uh, bear risk in them. If you uh, make errors in, uh, in these uh, contracts uh, uh, or for any other reason uh, would be liable uh, towards these clients that, that can influence the continuity of your uh, of your operating company, um, if the costs of your operating company are higher than uh, the income of this operating company, in, uh, that can result in uh, discontinuity of your of your your company. Uh, probably, uh, what happened with Sense there uh, that the the sales numbers are not high enough to maintain all, all uh, the employees, and you could go bankrupt. Um, on the uh, uh, there's an arrow going from the operating company to the holding company, which is the license fee that's paid for the. Um, uh, can you go uh, license fee that's uh, paid for uh, the license on the IP that will be both financial payment. So money needs to move up to uh, go, get to the shareholders and uh, to the management that's uh, most of the time paid by the holding company. Um, but also the IP is part of the payment for the uh, license on the IP. So it's as a dividend uh, or as a payment, uh, as a license fee, uh, you can also transfer IP to the holding company, making sure that also new IP that is generated in the operating company uh, will in the end uh, be in the holding company. Okay, now this slide. I see the next slide. You you get a new slide. Uh, we were trying to uh, uh, give you uh, the the right slides with the story. Um, yeah. Now, how does this work in practice? Uh, again, we simplify this a bit. Uh, although not too much with Q layers because they were rather small when they already did this uh, uh, this acquisition uh, with us. Uh, what what did we find when we started with locating the the IP? Now there was a third founder, um, which 
turned out to have still have some IP rights. They're uh, uh, separated ways, but uh, again, in the uh, agreements between him and 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 in Q layers, there was uh, I think a very general term, but yeah, it was not clear that the IP rights by him would be transferred into the uh, into the company. So that needed to be uh, repaired. Ruben, uh, as uh, Jon already said, he already registered some domain names. Uh, they turned out to be on his personal account. And there were no intercompany licenses, licenses whilst most of the employees doing the essential work. Um, they were working in the, uh, in the operating company. So the software operating the robots uh, uh, and design rights were in the operating company. Then there was, I think, a small error by the uh, trademark attorney that uh, registered a trademark in the operating uh, company instead of in the holding company that also needed to be uh, transferred. So then uh, we started restructuring. They already had the right structure in terms of uh, the, the two uh, entities having the holding and the operating BV. Um, so we just needed to transfer everything to the uh, to the right entity. There was a deed of tra transfer by the founder. Uh, there was a, a deed of transfer uh, by Ruben, uh, Ruben Gretjens, the, the, the uh, other founder. Um, there was a deed of transfer by the Q layers BV to the holding um, and there and a loan agreement um, basically paying for the transfer of, of IP from the uh, operating company to the holding again to have commercially viable uh, agreement between the two entities um, and this loan is paid off uh, by the uh, license fees so there is no actual payment of any uh, any money uh, but on paper there is uh, there is money shifting from one to the other uh, which is after uh, a predetermined uh, period of time uh, paying off this loan uh, is settled between the two. So then uh, Yono had his uh, uh, perfect company to invest in in terms of, of IP structure, having uh, uh, the, 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 the two founders, no, no IP with them personally, all the IP in Q layers holding BV, a license um which transferred new ip rights into the holding uh and paid money uh coming from the contracts you see below uh to the q layers holding under terms and conditions which are uh, uh yeah viable viable uh, commercially viable and uh, on the other hand a license down from q layers holding to uh the operating company um and yeah, a very clean company, which may, which has a very good overview of what uh, what uh, IP rights there are. Now it's a very short list, but in uh, I think uh, the the small booklet about IP that uh, Q Layers has um, entails quite some IP uh, uh, regarding the patents they they use, uh, uh, the designs they have on these robots, and and and, and stuff like that. Okay. That was the, that was my part of the story. Uh, yeah, if you have uh, questions uh, about about that, uh, feel free to to ask them, or maybe uh, on a later stage, uh, message me, and I'll uh, happily explain it. Uh, you know, the things that are not uh, entirely clear. Yeah, and this was all needed to make me really happy. Uh, because this fairy tale ended with a with a really nice closing, and we invested in uh, in Q layers partly because the uh, the IP is now very well secured in a holding company. So I thank you for your attention as well.